Playdate is one of the most interesting pieces of hardware I've come across, but most of what you hear about it when you hear about it is focused on the crank. However, as polarizing as that little handle is, I find that there's so much more to the Playdate. Every aspect of this little wonder machine is deliberately chosen from the black and white screen to the very unique way the games are being delivered. Then there are the surprising hardware capabilities. When you see them for the first time, you'll immediately notice that this isn't your usual retro handheld, it's a modern machine with modern capabilities. But then the horizon widens even more and you realize it's not just about playing games, it's also about making them. So for this video I'm going to try to break it up into the usual parts. First we have a look at the hardware, even taking a little peek inside, then the games, and finally I'm going to try to make one myself, with varying degrees of success. So if you've been on a fence in one of these, or if you saw it somewhere else and were curious what all the fuss is about, maybe this video is for you. If so, swipe right and come along on a playdate. At around 74 to 76 mm on either side, it's an almost perfectly square little box. With a thickness of around 9 mm, it's also just ever so slightly chunkier than a 6th generation iPad mini. Then there are the four buttons, two for various context commands and two for action, a super clicky d-pad and a single mono speaker to the right, which sounds great by the way, it's much more competent than the initial looks or the games might suggest. Don't crank the volume too high though, as it does start to break up a bit. Crack the stars to crack the joke, it's a beautiful joke. At the center or slightly off the left if you will, we have a 1-bit black and white screen with a resolution of 400 by 240. 1-bit means the pixels will be either on or off. Now, if you've been kicking around on this planet for long enough, you will no doubt remember devices back in the days that sometimes had something called a grayscale display. At least, I hope that's the right term. Those displays were capable of showing multiple levels of grey. The original Game Boy, for example, had four levels according to Wikipedia. The Playdate is not capable of such things, but this intentional design choice creates a very distinctive look, add to that a much higher resolution than that of its ancestors, as well as an increased refresh rate, and you'll be presented with some of the most beautifully and smoothly animated pixel art you'll ever see. If you flip the good thing around and take a look at the back, we get a nicely embossed Playdate branding, as well as some reassuring government certifications. But as much as I would love to talk about this underwater cheeseburger icon here, we should probably get to the most distracting part of this little bundle of joy. The crank. This twist is probably what sets the Playdate apart the most from other handhelds when it comes to its input choices. In its resting state, it's neatly tucked into the side, but when called to action, can be pulled out and whipped around in public for everybody to enjoy. But even when not called for, it's pretty enjoyable to fidget around with it as it is very solid and firm. If you look closely, you can also spot the construction, which works by a little ball that drops into a groove on either end. It also doesn't feel as if it would break anytime soon, given that it is made of metal, but since it is a much more complex mechanism than that of a button or d-pad, for example, I am hoping that it will last during the play its lifespan. There's also a 3.5mm combo jack for headphone and microphone, so you can technically plug in a mic or use the built-in one which is right next to it. To the right we have a USB-C port for charging as well as developing games, which we'll be getting into later. The construction is otherwise very simple, there are just four screws holding the back plate in. They look a little weird at first due to the holes, which I believe only exist for accessory reasons like this neat folding case that contains small pins to make sure it's perfectly aligned every time. The case is also magnetic on both sides and will sandwich the date in a soft rubbery embrace, very similar to an iPad folio case, but unlike those, the date won't react or shut down when being closed. You also can't use it as a stand. That use case is probably reserved for the yet-to-be-released desktop stand and pen holder, which is a seriously awesome looking accessory that I must purchase when it becomes available. But let's get back to the disassembly. A regular flathead will suffice to loosen up the screws. After that, you need something thin to pry open the plastic clasps that still hold the back plate in. It's a bit annoying, but once you clear one side, you can simply move along the edge to pop out the rest. Upon removing the back plate, we see a small magnet glued to the back. Then there's everything else, including a little warning message telling us to be careful and that we will be held accountable for any damages. To the right we get a 760 mAh battery that'll give us around 8 hours of gameplay or 14 days of standby. One curious part about the Playdate is that you cannot turn it off, there's no option for it in the menu and hitting the power button on the top will only lock it. In that state the Playdate will display the time in one of its three configurable ways, analog, digital or word. 
Fun fact here, the screen will change from a light lettering on a black background to a black lettering on a white background, depending on the time of day. Although this isn't an ink display, it uses so little power that it did last for two weeks as advertised when you leave it on the desk without touching it. I've been enjoying this quite a bit as I was once looking for something like this to give me a more stylized display of the passing time, so I feel delighted with this extra feature. Anyway, let's get back to the inside. There are further 8 screws holding everything together, you don't have to remove all of them to lift out the skeleton, some are holding in the mainboard, but if you do you can separate all the pieces at once, but be careful when you do so as there are delicate ribbon cables connected to the display and the crank. Speaking of the crank, it is possible to lift it out of the case, which I won't be doing here, but one really interesting aspect of its construction is the use of a magnet to determine its position. For comparison, you probably have heard about the drift issue which plagues most modern analog sticks, that's when they start to send out false signals even in their resting state. Drifting, so to speak. There's no remedy for this and there have been attempts to draw more attention to this issue, but I recently learned that there is a technical solution. For example, on the Steam Deck you can buy electromagnetic replacement sticks that will not only cure this illness, but actually increase accuracy. Why this hasn't been added to the first party controllers is beyond me, but maybe this is all still very new. I don't know. But getting back to the playdate, the crank uses the same mechanism, so we should be safe from drifting issues. The rest of the inside is pretty generic, and as much as I enjoy poking around the innards of electronics, I think it's time to move on to the software side of things. But if you want to learn more about the inner workings, I would highly recommend the article and video over on ifixit.com, which shows a much more detailed approach and explanation. For us, however, it's time to crank it up to the games. The case of the Playdate games is quite an interesting one. Unlike most players in the retro handheld space which rely on an existing library through some sort of emulation, or in the case of a more powerful device such as the Steam Deck which builds on top of an existing hardware platform in order to get to the games, the Playdate is in a very unique position. Due to the fact that we've got an uncommon aspect ratio and an arguably very limiting 1-bit output, there's no existing library that could be easily emulated, it's simply too different. The result, however, is much more beneficial to the Playdate, as every game ends up being designed specifically for it. This creates an exclusivity when it comes to the titles, but of course, as it always is with new hardware, it's not gonna stop anybody from slapping a version of Doom on here or any of the other titles that seem to get ported onto every platform imaginable. Heck, somebody even managed to run Skyrim on a pregnancy test at some point, so who's to say that the Playdate will only ever have titles that solely exist on the Playdate, but the point I'm trying to make is that the deliberate design choices force developers to create unique experience, and those don't even have to include the crank as the rest of the controls are entirely sufficient for a full experience. When you turn on the Playdate for the first time, you'll be greeted with two games and then two more every week for 12 weeks, totaling 24 games that are generously included with your initial purchase. Now, I loved this approach when I first heard about it, and after going through these first 12 weeks, I feel that this really encapsulates the idea of the Playdate, which is to create these short, fun little experiences that take you off on a journey, or a short date, if you will. The fact that you don't get all 24 at once also gives you enough time to really appreciate every single title. Take the Steam Deck for comparison. When I first got it, I downloaded every game in my library I could think of, but in the end maybe only played one for more than an hour. Granted, my deck ended up sunsetting a little early, so it might be a bit of an unfair comparison. But I'm sure you know what I mean, when you get a new GPU or a brand new PC, you'll no doubt go through your entire library and try out all of your old games. What better way to test out that brand spanking 3090? then CSGO. Those extra frames probably won't compensate for the lack of skill though, at least not in my case. But not on a playdate, there are no old titles and without some effort there won't be an onslaught of classics, so I am forced into new waters, which I love. One of the first four games in your library is called Casual Birder, a hipster Pokemon snap if you will, where you go around and try to take pictures of, well, birds. The crank is used to pull focus on your camera and feels quite satisfying. Another one is Whitewater Wipeout, a surfing game that reminded me of a PlayStation 2 title called Surfroid, mostly because I wasn't able to properly control the surfer back then, and neither can I now. You suck! One of the more complex games, if you can call it a game, is Boogie Loops, which is essentially a chiptune sequencer. It comes with three tracks preloaded that you can change using the various available sounds. The controls are a bit challenging, as it takes a while to get a hang of how everything works, but shows off the capabilities and limitations of the hardware nicely. It's pretty fun, but be warned, this one can steal many late night hours from you. 
For the other titles, as much as I'd love to talk about them, I feel that I would spoil the fun for future Playdate owners as the practice of waking up in the morning and seeing the top LED flashing is quite exciting. What I can say is that there is a fairly wide array of genres within the first 24 titles, some of which are truly uniquely created games, while others are interpretations of existing puzzlers and arcade classics, but with a twist. Or a crank, if you will. I most liked the adventure titles, some of which felt like small interactive comic books for which I got a very special spot in my heart. I hope most people will find at least something fun to enjoy in here. And while not everything will wow you, they are fun, even if you just play them once and then forget about them. You know, like a first date, there are no stakes and it's just about getting to know each other and figuring out if you want to continue or not. Or if you're dating somebody like me, it's about figuring out where the nearest exit is. 24 also didn't seem like a lot in the beginning, but having all of them now shows off just how much that actually is. You can luckily delete the ones you don't like, that way you can limit your selection and keep the playdate clean with only what you enjoyed, but what if you're looking for something new? While a date or a prize for the second season hasn't officially been announced yet, we can only hope that it'll be similar to the first one. We'll be getting two games per week for a certain amount of time, at least I hope that. But if you can't wait, there are two additional things you can do right now to get a lot more out of your playdate. From the get-go, Panic, the creators behind Playdate, have been very open to experimentation with their new offspring. Even before the hardware was released, you were able to tinker around with a virtual version, and Panic encouraged everyone to try and create their own experiences ahead of time. And so people did, and a lot they did. When I first saw this list on itch.co, I just got a big grin on my face, especially seeing things like leak spins, something that is more nostalgia nonsense than anything else, but it's a clear indication of the creative fun people have here. Take this one for example, it's called A Joke That's Worth 99 Cents. In this game, a catchy tune plays in the background while a small character gets thrown into the scene. The objective is to balance the character with your crank and catch the stars as they appear at different locations. Every time you do, an additional paragraph of the joke is being told. If you fail, everything resets and begins anew. Now, I challenge you to not burst into laughter while trying to play this absolute ingenious concept. This is exactly the type of game that truly makes my day. It's so utterly nonsensical that I can't help but love it. It made me forget everything for a minute and just enjoy the absolute silliness and pointlessness of everything everywhere all at once. I find it hard to put into words how much I love seeing these kinds of games, and I'm sure Panic feels the same way. They went into this fully embracing the community, broadcasting their support to help people turn their ideas into reality. Games do, after all, make a system, and the easier it is to make games, the more people will do it and the better the games will get. But for mortals like us who are not as capable, it's very welcome to see that sideloading is super easy too. It just takes a couple of minutes. Once you get the game, you simply log in online, go to sideload, and upload the zip file that contains the PDX. Then go to the settings on your playdate, then games, and wait for the list to be refreshed. Scroll all the way down to the bottom until you see the section My Games. Here you will find all the titles that you uploaded into your account. You can then select the one you want to download and install it. Just like with the official games from the season pack, you'll unwrap your new goodie and hopefully enjoy it. If you have a playdate and haven't checked out these extras, Stop this video right now and go get yourself some games, unless, of course, you want to make some games. Before we get into this, a short disclaimer. I'm not a developer, nor a game designer, so I won't be covering intricate details on how to do things, but in a previous life, I used to build simple websites, first using PHP and then migrated over to the world of frontend, where I spent my last days trying to make websites look pretty. So my experience with understanding basic code will have an advantage over people who have never seen or written a single line. That being said, I do really think that making games for the playdate is doable even as a complete newbie but you do have to commit time in order to achieve it. I also didn't want to create a gap of months between this and the last video, so what I set out to create was the simplest thing that I could think of, which is the Cheese Turbulence logo waving away while the end credits tune plays in the background. Now, after downloading Leak Spin, I thought it would be cool if the crank would likewise control the tempo of the song, so I began my work by downloading the SDK as well as watching a bunch of tutorial videos. We essentially have three ways to make a game on the playdate. The first one is Pulp, an online editor that lives completely in your browser. Pulp obviously has its limitations, but what makes it really cool is the fact that you don't have to write a single line of code in order to create a fully working game. You start out with a basic setup of a movable character, objects to collect, and a level to walk around in. 
You can then change the font, edit or add more levels, and play around with a really fun sequencer. If you then need more, you can also use Pulp Script, which gives you additional options, but again, you don't have to. Now, I quickly learned that Pulp wasn't gonna work for me. I first thought I could use the sequencer to recreate a song, but I couldn't figure out how to control it using the crank, and by now, I believe that's actually not possible. That's not to say that you cannot create unique experiences, but be wary of the limitations. However, it is still very cool to see something like this exist entirely in your browser. Then there are two additional ways of creating a game that will require coding. The first one being Lua, which is a lightweight embeddable scripting language. The second one is Native C. Using C from what I read and understand is the choice if performance is of the utmost importance. Think of it as riding a bike without training wheels, while Lua will be with training wheels, and Pulp is essentially a tricycle. I only checked out Lua, so if you're interested in how this works with C, I'm sorry, but you probably have to find somebody more capable. I went ahead and began setting up the environment, and if I, as a semi-newbie may say, was very easy to understand on how it works. The basic structure of it was familiar to what I remember from my limited days as a web developer. Also working on a Mac seemed easier as Panic does have its own ID called Nova, which I actually used back when it was still called Coda. Anyway, using Nova you can instantly try out your game by hitting Command R, which will compile and run it in the simulator. If you can't wait for your physical playdate to arrive, you may actually download games from itch.co and simply drag the PDX files into the simulator. Of course, you will lose the magic of playing it on its intended hardware, so I would advise against this. At this point, I would like to express my gratitude towards Panic's incredibly well-documented and easy-to-follow tutorials on how to set up and get things running. It's been almost seven years since I last coded, so I was a bit rusty but still managed to pretty quickly get things up especially thanks to the numerous examples found in the SDK. One of the examples was a MIDI player, which instantly sparked an idea on how I was going to approach this. Since the credit tune was something I made using my synthesizer as a MIDI keyboard, I was able to export it as a MIDI file after some tweaks. I then added it to the folder and changed the path to the new file. After this, there were two things left to do for me. Somehow change the tempo using the crank and get that flag up and waving. The tempo change took quite a while, and while I'm not happy with how the code looks or works, I'm simply not good enough to get this running within a reasonable amount of time in a cleaner way. Somebody with proper programming skills will probably look at this and say something along the lines of, this is hilarious, which is something that actually happened to me around 10 years ago. Back then I once tried to make a game using JavaScript. It was a top-down shooter and I got it running, even having a real boss battle at the end with proper hit points and explosions and everything. I was at a conference at one point and I met up with a real game dev and I eagerly wanted to show him my code as I knew it wasn't good and had quite the memory leaks. After he looked at it for a few minutes, he started chuckling and uttered the phrase, this is hilarious. To cut the story short, I never went back to it. In general, I never felt that coding was something that I was particularly good at. I can get things running, but the result was never the most efficient nor easy to maintain approach. Anyway, once again, the point I'm trying to make is that if I can get something up and running on this screen, you will be able to do so as well. As I had the flag as a video, I simply exported it at 400 by 240. I then went to a site to convert the video into a GIF changed it to 10 FPS and imported it into the project. GIFs are natively supported and you'll end up with something called an image table, which then lets you select each frame and display it individually on the screen. I used the get crank ticks function within the playdate's update cycle to check for the movement. During it, I simply cycle through the available 10 frames, either forward or backwards. For the MIDI, I couldn't figure out how to play it backwards, so that feature is yet to be added or probably never will unless somebody else does it. Even though it's not perfect, and even though it took me way longer than I would have wanted to, I really enjoyed tinkering around with the SDK. And while I wish something like this would have existed 15 years ago when I still dreamt of working in the gaming industry, I'm glad that at least now I finally made something that is running on gaming hardware, even if it isn't actually a game. The Playdate is truly one of the most unique devices out on the market right now. That's not because of the crank as mentioned at the beginning. I feel that sometimes that part really overshadows its other capabilities. At first glance, people might misjudge it, believing that the crank is the only unique selling point, 
or that it is just another retro handheld trying to capitalize on the ongoing nostalgia boom. Looking at the specifications, you might also push it off as a weak contender in the handheld space. You won't find roaring horsepower here or blazing graphics displayed on a vibrant OLED screen. But don't let the initial appearance fool you. There's quite a bit under the hood. Next to the physical controls, there is a built-in microphone, an accelerometer, add to that Wi-Fi connectivity and Bluetooth. And maybe even Bluetooth audio in the future? Please panic? But that's not to say that the playdate is perfect either, I do have my issues with some of the choices. The biggest one is, unfortunately, the screen. As much as I love its looks, I do find it difficult to use more often than not. It either reflects the living bagel out of everything, or is too dark and the lack of backlight really destroys any hope of having this sit on the bedside next to you for a pre-sleep snack. Then there's the lack of wireless audio. I know you got a headphone jack, but everything else in my possession these days is wireless. I feel that releasing a device requiring wired headphones is the equivalent of shipping something with a micro USB connector. It's not the end of the world, but it's an inconvenience. These issues don't seem to be that big of a deal, but it bothered me considering everything else is so very carefully picked. You can tell that there was a lot of thought that went into designing this. Deliberate limitations craft a very curated experience and force a unique approach to game design and consumption that narrows it down to the essence, to the games above everything else. Now, I don't know anybody from Panic, and I have never spoken to anybody from them, although there are podcasts, streams, and much more one could consume to learn more about their inner working. So what I'm about to say might sound a little cheesy or maybe even plain wrong, but their works over the last decade or so have always given me the impression that they pursue to create the things they feel the most passionate about, and the Playdate is just another prime example of that. It's more than just another gaming handheld. It's a love letter to playing and creating video games. So it's no surprise that it only took a couple of dates before I was completely swayed by this little adorable box and by now have completely fallen in love with it. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed another one of my ramblings. It's been quite a hot August over here, which made working on the videos a bit more difficult as the great outdoors are quite alluring. If you want to get your hands on the flag thing I made, I left a link to the game, the source code and the tutorials I followed down in the description below. So inspect it, rip it apart and do whatever you want with it. I hope you got some enjoyable weather on your side as well and that you got some time off from your busy work or school schedules. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching again and see you in the next one. Bye.